chapter 11. I'll begin by simply reading the first three verses, going to an introduction. We're going to look at the, the entire chapter today. It's, it's what has been referred to as Peter's defense, and you'll see why it's, uh, it's been uh, entitled that in just a moment. But beginning at verse 1, Acts chapter 11, going to verse, uh, verse 3. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men, and you ate with them. Now, what has happened, and we saw this in chapter 10, is that the Gentiles had received the word of God. When the Bible speaks concerning the Gentiles here in verse 1, having received the word of God, that's another way of saying that the Gentiles had been born again. They had by faith welcomed God's word, and as a result of that, they had received salvation. Because the word received means literally to welcome or to be associated with. And so when it begins here by telling us that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. It's another way of simply saying that word had come in Judea that the Gentiles are now entering into the body of Christ. They have received God's word and they have been saved. And so the people in the area, when this happened in that region, uh, when it happened, began to speak about it and word had begun to filter all the way down south. It had traveled south to the city of Jerusalem. Now, there are those who are hearing this who are concerned as they do so, as they hear, because this, this um, reception of the word of God by the Gentiles is countering their traditional understanding of how salvation occurs. So you see, they, they normally would have thought, now these are Jews, they normally would have thought that in order to have a relationship with God, then you would have needed to have been, if you were male, circumcised, and you most certainly would have been brought under the law. And so as they're hearing this is taking place and the Gentiles are entering into the kingdom of God without following Moses' law and without being circumcised in the ritual sense, well, they begin to be concerned about it. And so what happens in verse 2, it says that Peter came to Jerusalem those of the circumcision began to contend with him. And this is what they were saying. You went into uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Again, as I mentioned to you that when, when Peter went and spent time with Cornelius in the home of a Gentile, that, that broke Jewish law and tradition. There's no way that a kosher Jew would ever have fellowship with an uncircumcised, unkosher Gentile. And so that's what we saw happen when he went and spoke to them, gave them the word of God. And that's when, when Peter had that initial revelation that, that God is not a respecter of persons, but that anybody, whether Jew or Gentile, who hears the gospel of grace and embraces it by faith can be saved and enter into the kingdom. Well, that was a new revelation to him, but it's something that these people have yet to be initiated into. And so they're upset about it. And they're beginning to contend with him concerning that. Now, when it says here in verse 2, those of the circumcision, uh, that can be speaking of uh, Jews, you know, just regular Jewish people who had, had been saved. But we need to also remember that among the early believers were Pharisees, and Pharisees who had been converted to faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, Pharisees actually were coming to faith in the Lord. We'll see later on in chapter 15, verse 5, how it says there, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised, required to obey the law of Moses. So, so there was the regular Jewish uh, people who were perhaps contending and upset, and there were more than likely some Pharisees also who were upset about this. And so they're becoming stumbled by this seeming lack of religious respect and all. We need to remember that Jewish customs were normally followed. The Jewish believers at that time were, were meeting in synagogues. They were still going to the temple. Many Jews believed 
and were not yet breaking away from the traditions that they had received. And that happens even today amongst those who are not raised in a, in a Jewish sense, but that, that still exists today with those who are, who are coming to faith in Christ and, and perhaps they were raised in a particular religious tradition. And so they, they continue to believe and to hold fast to the things that they at one time had embraced because that's what they had been taught to believe. I don't know what your background is. My background being Roman Catholic, when I got saved, I got saved and the next week I went to Mass because I was now a Christian, but I didn't necessarily think in terms of me, and I never have thought in terms of me being now a Protestant. I didn't think of it that way at all. So what I did is I went to Mass. I went to church because that's what Christians do. And I went to the Catholic Mass at St. Pius X Church. I brought a Bible because when I got saved, I was told you need to read the Bible. So I brought my Bible, went to Mass by myself. And I sat there. I had been raised Catholic, therefore I knew the ritual and all. And I waited to open up the Bible. It had been a while, you can tell, since I'd been in church. So I'm waiting to open up the Bible because I was taught you read the Bible when you're a Christian. And then I discovered that you really don't. And when that happened, I said to myself, well... I probably would be better suited if I'm going to grow in my faith to go to a place that opens the Bible. So it wasn't like anger and it wasn't resentment. It was just, it made sense to me. I need to be where I'm going to be taught how to follow Jesus. But I didn't get upset with the ritual. I didn't get upset with all of that. I just realized that that was no longer going to be part of my life. But there are others who embrace and continue in that, that ritual and all, and and so they become saved, and yet they, they hold fast to those things, and sometimes it takes a while for them to let them go. When Marie, my wife, got saved, um, she was a very devout Catholic, coming from a very devout Catholic home. And so when she got saved, I, I never pressed her about anything. She would, she would go to Mass on Sunday mornings, and then she'd go to church with me Sunday nights. And she did that for some time. And I didn't twist her arm, and I didn't say anything to her. I just, you know, I know the Holy Spirit is going to do a work in her the way that he did it in me. So it wasn't a point of argumentation at all. That's what she did. But about eight months to a year into our relationship, um, I was at her, her place, and I was sitting on the couch. I still remember this, and, and her purse was seated next to me, and it was asking me to look into it, and so I did. And I took her wallet, you know, and I was just looking at, she had pictures in there, and I was throwing away pictures of old boyfriends, you know. And so, so I saw a particular picture there, and, and she came and sat down next to me, and I still remember the conversation. I looked at her and said, I thought you were my girlfriend. She goes, I am your girlfriend. I said, then why are you going out on me? She goes, what? I said, you got another boyfriend. She goes, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I said, you're, you're, you're going out with Joe. She said, Joe? And I pulled out a picture of St. Joseph. <laughs> and she says, oh, there's, there are things from my background I haven't even thought about. She used to have a little brown scapular. You know, one of those little things that you can wear, and if you die, you go instantly to heaven, things like that. She used to have a little statue of Joseph on the dashboard of her car. And, you know, he was facing traffic, and his hands <laughs> were over his eyes. And he melted. So he was the hunchback. You know, you can hold on, and you do. I'm not giving you permission to, but it's a fact that you can hold on to certain traditions until you get to know what the truth is, and the truth sets you free. And so what happens here is they're upset because these are people of the circumcision. They're hearing that Gentiles are receiving the word of God, and they're hearing that the apostle Peter had gone and actually eaten with them, and to eat with an unkosher person 
was a religious taboo. You didn't do that. And so they're upset about that in that he had done that. You see, it was an outrage to them that, that Peter actually was eating with Gentiles because a part of that, that uh, process of eating with somebody is to, uh, it really is to be having fellowship with them and actually being identified with them. And uh, it was something that they had a real, real problem with. Uh, this is something Jesus himself actually dealt with when it came to being identified with those whom he ate with. You see it in Mark 2, verse 16, when it says, when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? Because to, to eat and drink with them is to be identified with them. And so they're upset that the apostle Peter has gone and eaten with Gentiles. And so Peter has to rehearse what has happened. He has to begin to speak to them. And it says here in verse 4, Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, Three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa, call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words, or you words, by which you and all your household will be saved. And... As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And so he rehearses. This is why it's called Peter's defense. He's rehearsing what had taken place. He's sharing with them how that these things had had, had occurred. And so they had a religious as well as a cultural opinion concerning the, uh, the Gentiles. So how did Peter deal with that? Well, notice with me what we just read. He, he gave an orderly explanation of how it all came about. He, he didn't react with pride. After all, I'm an apostle. Who are you to question me concerning how God has led me? He didn't react with pride. He didn't tell them to be quiet and to leave it alone, and, and he didn't belittle them for asking. He simply gave a synopsis of all about how all of this came about. And that, to me, is a model of ministry, by the way. I believe that we ought to be able, I as a, a pastor teacher, I should be prepared to be able to explain to people. There are times people want to know certain things, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm on panels quite often, and I answer questions related to, to things and all uh, pertaining to church order and Calvary traditions and various things like that. I do it all the time. And I'm asked questions, and I give answers. I think it's a wise thing to do, and that's what we see here in, in Scripture. He didn't say, you know, you have no right to ask me. I'm an apostle. Who are you? I'm an apostle. You're not even a apostle, so leave it alone. No, he didn't do that. So what he does, he, he's just sharing. This is how it took place. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 15, how he says, I began to speak, as I began to speak, notice, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. The Holy Spirit fell upon them in the same way that he did on us. As he was preaching, they received the message. They mixed with it faith. It produced the fruit of salvation. He gave the gospel. When you read what he had to say in, uh, in chapter 10, you see that he gave the gospel. 
You'll see that he pointed that Jesus was anointed by the Spirit and with power. As you read it, you see that he's, he said that Jesus did good, that he delivered people who were possessed, he healed the people who were sick. As he was preaching, he made it clear that Jesus was put to death, but he also centered on the reality of Jesus being resurrected. And as you go through his sermon, he concluded by promising forgiveness of sins to anyone who trusted in Jesus. And as he was preaching, God was moving. God was moving in the hearts of those who were there. That's how you, by the way, got saved. That's how you got saved. God, when you were hearing the message and the word of God, and I'll, I'll develop this with you, and as the word of God was being preached, God was doing a work in you, bringing conviction by the Spirit and an awareness of fact of salvation. And what he did is he brought them to faith and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. They were saved because even as we see in chapter 10, uh, they had assembled to hear all the words that God had commanded Peter to say. And if, if I approach the word of God with that heart, and that to me, I don't want you to, don't let that get past you. If you listen to the word of God, not just the opinions of the preacher, if you listen to the word of God with a heart to obey all things that he has commanded, God does a work in you. That's how it works. I'll develop that in a second. But the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So one thing that we need to remember, and this is very, very practical and important, and especially this our day, we need to remember that it is the proclamation, it's the preaching and teaching of the word of God, and it's the receiving of the gospel that saves you. We need to remember that God's word is the seed that produces salvation. It, it isn't the music that does that. It isn't the personality of the preacher that does that. It isn't the environment of the people of God that produces salvation. That is so basic. That is so basic. But if there's anything that is true of the church in the 21st century in the year 2017, is that it is very slowly being twisted to an entertainment-oriented group of people. Absolutely. People who have no heart to hear the word of God and to obey it. There's no doubt about that. And what we're ending up with right now is people who will choose the place they attend based on how they feel when they leave and how they feel while they're there. And when they're uncomfortable because the conviction of the Spirit may reach their heart, rather than saying, woe unto me, I'm a sinner. God, help me. I want to be a better person. We simply say, I was condemned. I felt judged. When in reality, what God is doing is convicting you so that he can turn you from your sin so that you might be blessed by him and have the life that you've always desired to have. But instead of us saying, God, reveal my heart, we have a tendency of saying, don't judge me. I wonder what would happen if the Lord were able to really show me the condition of my heart, if I would really be open to seeing that. Because I know of all people, I can be most self-deceived and think I'm doing just fine, thank you very much, when in reality, my pride, my arrogance, my lack of humility could be keeping me from the blessings of God. And so we have to be very careful that we understand that when the word of God is being proclaimed, if you want to change, and there's a desire you need to have, God will give you the ability to. And as he speaks the word to you through his Bible, what happens is the word of God takes root and transformation can occur. When um, Paul was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy in chapter 3, verse 15, this is what he said to Timothy. He said, you have known, listen, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's the word of God when received by faith that produces the ability to be saved. It doesn't come any other way. It comes through the word of God. That's why I've had young parents ask me in the past um, about doing devotions with their children. And they'll ask me, what do you recommend? When my kids were small and we did what we called family devotions, which was a time set aside every night before they went to bed, where I would have them seated in front of me in the front room, and I would have them in front of me, and this is what would happen, you know. And they were kids. They were small growing up. And a lot of times when they're little kids, they'll, they'll start, uh, you know, bouncing into each other and getting irritated because he's too close to me. Oh, he's looking at me, you know, those kinds of things. And there's that griping and, oh, don't touch me. And I'd say, Marie, you're being a bad example to the children. You got to stop that. <laughs> they would start that. And do you know this is the truth before the Lord? This is a fact. I would sit down on the couch, and my children would sit on the carpet in front of me, all four of the little ones there. Sometimes Marie would be, and they would be making noise. This is, this is how it happened every night. I gave my kids devotions every night, five out of seven days of the week. Five out of seven days. The only two days they did not receive devotions at night were Wednesdays and Sundays and Sunday nights. Why not Wednesday night and Sunday night? Because they were in church Wednesday night and Sunday night. And when they sat down, and they would be doing that as kids do, all I would do is this. I'd have my Bible on my lap, and I would open it like this. And when I opened it, I taught them to be quiet. I taught them to be quiet. And I said, when this book is open, your mouth is closed. I taught my children that from the time they were small because God's word, when spoken, should be heard. And you can't hear and talk at the same time. So you need to listen. So I taught my children to reverence the word of God. Am I saying I raised perfect kids? No, I didn't. Of course I didn't. They received their mother's nature. How could I? <laughs> I tried. I really did. No, they received my nature, the Adamic nature, that old man. They're sinners by nature. They have to die to those things but they also are encouraged to discipline themselves, to hear the things that are important. And no, they weren't perfect. And I would never stand up, and some of you know my kids, and you'll say, amen, pastor, they're not perfect. And that's true, they're not. But you know what? I just poured into them, and do you know, as old as they are to this day, I still pour into them. I still pour into them, because not only am I their father, but I'm also their pastor. And I pour into my children because I know that the enemy is after my children and he's after my grandchildren. So you pour into them, and that's what you do. Because I knew that I could pour into them the word of God, and the word of God is what is going to be active in their salvation. So it wasn't going to be me reading just storybooks of Bible characters, though I did that. It wasn't going to be just me reading history of, of great missionaries and great and great. Uh, uh, pastors and teachers, which they got. It was going to be the word of God. And that's how it works. It's the word of God that saves you. In, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so he says in verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John, indeed, baptized with water, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And so John, indeed, baptized with water. John, in other words, is not the Holy Ghost baptizer, and neither were the apostles. The Holy Ghost baptizer is Jesus Christ. He's the one who pours out the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3, verse 11, John said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus is the Holy Ghost baptizer. And so 
because Jesus is, Jesus does that work. And as they were hearing the word of God and their hearts returned to God, God poured out a Pentecost experience upon them. He poured out the Holy Spirit upon them, even as he says in verse 15, even as he had done upon them at the beginning. They had their own, if you will, their own session of what would be called a Pentecost. And God, he said in verse 17, gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed. So he's saying this, basically, listen, he's saying, if you have an argument, argue with God. Argue with God. Now, remember, the apostle Peter had argued with God, and you, you don't win arguments with God. You just don't. You know, and Peter had argued with God when God said, rise up, Peter, slay, slay and eat. And he says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unkosher. Peter had had an argument with the Lord, and then God just silenced him. He says, don't call unclean what I call clean. End of story. No more conversation, no more argument. So, one, if you have an argument concerning how God can pour his Holy Spirit upon you, you're arguing with God. Don't argue with, with the apostle. Because arguing with God is not a good idea. Isaiah 40, verse 13, asks the question, who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Who here has? This is the last time God called you or texted you and said, listen, I have a problem, and I, could you give me some advice? I don't know what to do. Jesus is busy, and I don't know where the Spirit's taken off to. <laughs> no, I don't think so. How about, how about Job 21, verse 22? Can anyone teach knowledge to God since he judges even the highest? There are a whole lot of people who don't know God who think that they can instruct God. That's simply because they don't know him. And so, one, it's not a good idea to argue with the Lord. But two, uh, he points out that God is the one who gives the gift. He said God gave them the same gift. God gave them the same gift, which is in reference to the Holy Spirit. So the important thing to note in this is that the Spirit is given as a gift of grace and is not received by human efforts. God promised this gift. Christ purchased it. The Word reveals it. And thousands have experienced it, somebody said. And that's true. And so this is a gift. You, you do not receive the power of the Holy Spirit through any efforts on your part. You don't receive the power of the Holy Spirit through doing spiritual things or anything like that. Jesus said that the Father will give the Spirit to those who ask. And if there's anything, and this I, I want to emphasize for just a moment, if there's anything that the church, the body of Christ needs right now, it's a refreshing in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have got to, many of you have got to be tired because you're trying so hard to be good. You've got to be tired. You've got to be trying so hard to be good. And the bottom line is, it's good to be disciplined in the things of walking worthy. I would never say be sloppy and just run around doing nasty things, of course. But you know, the Holy Spirit has been provided as a grace to us. You receive the power of the Holy Spirit by turning from your sin and turning to him. And you say to God, Lord, without you, I can do nothing. And, and, and you have promised that you have said it, your father gives, gives, uh, gives the Holy Spirit. And you have said even, even an evil father would not give a serpent uh, or a rock to a child who was hungry for an egg or bread. Even so, you said, I, being an evil father, know how to give good gifts to my children. Even so, you are a good father, and you will give your spirit to those who but ask. You know, on, on an occasion, we already saw it in chapter 5 in the book of Acts, verse 32. We saw how Peter said that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. You know, we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I need the power of your spirit. Lord, I want Jesus Christ to be dominant in my life. I hate my flesh. I hate what I do in the flesh. I hate the way I can be when my flesh is dominant. I need your power, Lord. And I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, in, in many ways, using just a very poor illustration, you know, I'm a leaky vessel. I need to be refilled. I need to be refilled. My flesh can dominate. I can begin to gravitate towards the, the things of my flesh 
and, and resist even the power of the Spirit. So I need to be renewed in the power of the Spirit on a daily basis. And since I, I know that the promise of God, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, is still applicable to us today. I know that Jesus said you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I know that he has promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who believe and to those who ask. And if there's anything, guys, that you need right now, if there's anything you need and this church needs and the church in the United States and throughout the world needs, it's, a, it's an inundation, it's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our life. You see, one of the things that happened, let me give you a short and brief illustration that contains a bit of a history lesson but what you need to do is you need to remember, and some of you were alive and others were not yet born when God was doing a revival here in the United States and he began to pour his Holy Spirit out through what was called and has been referred to as the Jesus Movement. And what happened at that time is something I believe God wants to continue to do, and that is that he began to pour his Spirit out on young people and all people, really, because Calvary Chapel, a lot of times I think of Calvary in my early days when I was 20 years old, and I saw a lot of young people. Part of the reason I saw a lot of young people is I went to what would have been youth kinds of things. And so there are going to be a lot of young people there. But in, in the reality of the actual church life, there were, there were old people in their 80s sitting next to hippies in their, in their teens. It was made up of, of, of uh, uh, businessmen and, and people who walked into the church barefooted. Uh, Pastor Chuck tells, used to tell humorous stories about how offended the uh, elders would get because the hippie kids would walk in barefooted. And I was one of those hippie kids who would walk in barefooted because shoes were just, who needs them? And, and, I, and I would walk in barefooted. I was always barefooted and I uh, went to church barefooted and it, we didn't even think about it. I'd never wore shoes anywhere, supermarkets, uh, anywhere. I did not wear shoes. As a matter of fact, when this church began, my mother's the one who made me wear shoes when I taught. Because I would teach barefoot. I would kick my shoes off and teach barefoot. That's, that's just me. At home, I never wear shoes at home. You know, I'm still a hippie at, at heart, you know. <laughs> and we would sit there. And I still remember sitting in, in the, the, the pews there and, and the communion cup holders. I, I remember getting my big toe stuck in one. You know, that's the truth. And, and so it made me laugh when I heard Chuck say how the elders were mad because the hippie kids would get their toes stuck in the communion cup holders. And that's true, because I had it happen to me. It, 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 it's not something you try to do. You know, you just cross your feet, and before you know it, you're pulling your foot out, you know, because your toe got stuck in it. And so I remember that with humor and all, but what, had, what happened? What happened was God began to move in through two things, the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. You know, Pastor Chuck would be invited to come to conferences. They wanted to hear the secret of how he's reaching through his ministry, all these hippies. He said on one occasion he was invited to go speak, and the guy who invited him more than likely expected him to be one of these preachers who cried and got very emotional. And Chuck said at the end of his message, the only one crying in the congregation was the guy who invited him because he was sad that he invited him, because he didn't have the emotionality and the personality, because what Chuck did is he modeled to guys like me the power of the Word of God. And so he taught us, as my pastor, he taught us to love God's Word. But secondly, we were taught to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. I just got today an invitation from somebody who said he wants to show me how to how he built his big church, his words. I will teach you how I built my church. Well, I guarantee you, if he built it, it will not last. Because Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When it's built by Jesus, it lasts. When it's built by men, it dies. And any movement and any church that is built on the personality of a pastor or the entertainment factor of the church or the production of the entertainment factor of worship, any church that is built on a man is going to fail. It always will. 
But when the church is built on Jesus Christ and his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, it continues. And for those of you who do home Bible studies and do ministry, never forget that. It is the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see taking place here. He is saying, as I was sharing, God brought them into the kingdom of God through the power of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how God works. That's why we don't put our trust in men. We put our trust in the Lord. Now, as this is taking place, verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Often all we need to do is give a biblical explanation and the problem is solved. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, encouraged them all that they with purpose of heart should continue with the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. A great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And so persecution had arisen. Remember, persecution had arisen after Stephen had been martyred. We know that in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it states that a great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem. So when this persecution happened, uh, what did the Christians do? Did they stop speaking out of fear of being persecuted? Well, the answer is no. They took the message out of Jerusalem and took it into the world. So instead of stifling the message, the believers were more intent on sharing it. Now, as it states here in, in verse 19, at first, they spoke only to the Jews. But when it goes on into verse 20, it says some of them were men from Cyprus, Cyrene, who, and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. So they continued to go out and preach it to those who would hear. And God had made it already clear that uh, the message was to go out to all people. And the result is, verse 21, that the hand of the Lord is with them, and a great number believe, and a great number turn to the Lord. Again, take the word of, of God and proclaim it and see what happens. People turn to the Lord. See, sometimes you may be afraid to speak in the name of Jesus Christ. We're living in a time, and, and I'm speaking to people who know this, um, when you can actually be self-conscious about mentioning the name of Jesus. You've been basically forbidden to do so by our society for a little bit of time now. But the fact is, if you really trust the Lord, if you really do, and you really believe the message, you're going to share it. Jesus in Luke 21, 15 said it like this. He said, I'll give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Um, you just need to... You just need to um, really believe the message. Uh, I'll say it like this very briefly. Um, I'm pretty open with my faith. I'm an old man now. I'm pretty open with my faith, but you know what? I was open with my faith when I was 20. I was open with my faith when I was in the army. I was open about my faith when I got out of the army, when I went to college, when I went to secular school. I've been around educated people. I've felt so stupid. 
because compared to them, I am. I am. I remember professors, one in particular, she had two, I believe it was two, two master's degrees and a doctorate. And I remember how intimidated I was by her. And yet I shared with her. Why? Because the truth is the truth. I've, I, I have, as a young college student, speaking to extremely liberal, extremely progressive professors, I would, I would sit in class, again, secular colleges, Cal Poly, junior colleges like Rio Hondo, Cerritos, school like Cal State Fullerton, and I would sit there and I would listen to what was being said and then I would pray and I would say, God, give me an opportunity to share. And then I would. And yeah, I was mocked. And yeah, there were people who thought I was stupid. And yeah, there were people who looked at each other with one of those sidelong glances like, what an idiot. That's a fact. I was a young man. But I was real convinced about something. I was convinced there is a God. I was convinced that there is a heaven. I was convinced there's a hell. I was convinced that Jesus Christ is the savior of mankind. I was convinced that the power of the Holy Spirit can actually work in my life. I was convinced that the gospel is true. And I was convinced that I was supposed to share it. You know, that's just a fact. And, and you see, sometimes when, when people come to this fellowship, you may be new here and, and you see that, that guy up there speaking, and he, oh, he speaks like this, but he doesn't know what, what I go through. He doesn't know what it's like to sit in a college class with a, a brainiac professor who will mock you. <laughs> the fact is, is, yes, I do. And yes, I've been there. And yes, I've been mocked by professors. Yes. But that doesn't mean I should shut up. I discovered a long time ago when I tried to that I can't. I, I can't. I can't. There have been times, forgive me, it sounds like I'm boasting about myself. I'm not. I'm trying to illustrate something. There have been times when, when I would fold my arms and I would bite my tongue and I would say, don't say anything. Don't say anything. And my body literally vibrates. My body begins to shake. I'd be shaking. There were times when my mom saw this happening. I'm in a Bible study. She invited me to go to. The teacher's teaching things that are wrong, and I'm vibrating. And my mom looks at me like, uh-oh. <laughs> because like Jeremiah, I determined that I would say nothing, but your word was like a fire in me, and I had to speak. That's how it is. Listen, when you fall in love with the Lord, you can't help it. You can't, you can't help it. I, I can, I, we have classes here. You want to learn how certain scriptures can be used in street witness, yes, door-to-door -door witness, yes, ministering to, to cult members and Muslims, we can help you that. We can equip you with that, yes. But if you don't have a belief that Jesus Christ is everything and the power of the Holy Spirit is necessary, you'll just be educated but not usable. When you have in your heart a burning desire for people to know God, he'll give you opportunities to speak about him. That's how it works. What do you have that's more important than heaven? You have something more important than heaven? Do you, do, you, do you understand that your friends and your family are going to hell if they don't have Jesus? Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Because if you do, get on your face before God and say, God, give me opportunity to share with them. Lord, at least to give them an opportunity to know you. We need that today. We need that today, guys. We really, really do. I'm watching my nation go down and down and down because the church is silent and too caught up wanting to party. Too caught up wanting to party. Too caught up arguing with men like me. I can drink and go to heaven. You're a good evangelist for alcohol. How good are you for Jesus? How good are you for Jesus? Because a lot of people are good for sin, but they're not good for him. we got to be aware of that. What is your priority and where's your power come from? It comes from the word of God 
and the Spirit of God. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. And we need to understand that sometimes people are afraid to speak. But the fact of the matter is, open your mouth, Jesus said, and I will fill it. I will give you opportunities, and you will blow your mind. There's hardly anything more exciting than to see someone's eyes open up to Jesus and get saved. Hardly anything as exciting. I don't think there is anything as exciting as that. Listen, we need to remember that when you're faithful to him, he uses you. The Bible tells us here that the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed. Again, the Jesus movement was not centered on one person. God used many people to, to take the gospel out to an unsaved world. And there were people, many people, young and old, turned to, turning to the living, uh, living for Jesus Christ and sharing him. And, and that's the bottom line. And, and one of the things that will ultimately stifle the move of the Spirit is when we begin to give credit to, to individuals and begin to honor people uh, over the one who's saving people. We have to be very careful with that. We need to be careful to give uh, all glory to the Lord. We need to remember also that successful ministry isn't based on externals. Some people think that you need to be eloquent, you need to be energetic, you need to be charismatic, you need to be handsome, persuasive, funny, inventive, culturally sensitive, young, you name it. No, what you need to be is in love with Jesus Christ. And if you want to be used by the Lord and you want the hand of the Lord to be upon you, then seek the Lord and ask him to fill you with his spirit. Verse 21 says, God's hand was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. They were converted. And finally, in verse 22 following, it goes on to say, and I'll close at verse 30. News of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all. That with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Great many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. These day, in those days, uh, these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so, 22 following in 22, Barnabas lives up to his name because Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so what he's doing is he's encouraging the church as he sees God moving through his grace. And his encouragement is that they, with purpose of heart, should continue with the Lord. And one of the ways that is made possible is simply remain faithful to him and faithful to his word. So as a genuine minister, Barnabas is concerned that these new believers grow. Notice how he's described as being a good man, a man who's filled with the spirit and with faith. And that's why he exhorts them to continue with the Lord. It says in verse 25 that he departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. They were friends, so he went to seek him. And in verse 26, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, Antioch was the capital of Syria. It was the third largest city next to Rome and Alexandria. When you look at Antioch in ancient history during that day, it was a city that was known for commerce as well as culture. It was also known for sexual immorality. The people were worshipers of Artemis and Apollo, uh, as well as... Uh, the Syrian worship of Astarte. And Astarte had a cult of ritual prostitutes. So Barnabas wanted Saul to work alongside of him in the ministry at Antioch. Why? Well, Saul was a Hebrew scholar. He was fluent in Greek. He was acquainted with Gentile culture. He'd be a great asset in discipling and winning converts. The work was too big for Barnabas alone, so he needed help. It says in verse 26, when, when Saul arrived, they taught a great many people. So it's always good to minister with more than one person. And then it says, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It was here that they are now referred to as Christians. Up until that time when you've come into this chapter here, 
They've been referred to as disciples or brothers, believers. They're referred to as saints. They're followers of the way, but now they're being called Christian. The word Christian, by the way, means little Christ. Literally, that's what it means. Little Christ, like Christ, Christ-like or little Christ. It may have been used in a derogatory fashion at first. Here come those little Christs. And oh, by the way, they still say that that way today. Now, as this is all taking place, in conclusion, verses 27 through 30, there were prophets who came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Prophets were used in the church primarily to preach as well as to predict events of the future. We know that the apostles were referred to as the building block. They were the transmitters of God's word to men, but prophets were used to confirm the word that was preached as well as revealing events to come in the future. Here we're introduced to Agabus, and he predicts widespread famine, and that did occur during the time of Claudius, which was between the years of 41 and 54 AD. What happens, and we'll close with this, is there's a famine that occurs that he had prophesied. How did the church respond? Verses 29 and 30, they cared for him. The disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Once again, the church took care of the need. They cared about those in need. That's been the mark, by the way, of the church throughout our history, is to care for those in need. They heard that there was a need and according to their ability, they sent relief to the brethren who were dwelling in Judea or down south. Now, they had this uh, finances that they were going to give to them. How did they get it to them? It says in verse 30, they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. A couple of thoughts and then we'll close. One, I want you to notice this. This is something that will pass you by if I don't point it out because it passes me by too. Verse 30, this they also did and sent it to the elders. That's the first mention of elders in the church. The elders. This is the first time elders in the church are mentioned. You will see the word elder also uh, translated by the word bishop. It can also describe uh, the pastor teacher. Uh, it, is, it is an overseer. And so it's giving us an insight into the fact that the church had leadership. They were the elders. They were the overseers of the church, and their responsibility was in teaching and leading the body of Christ. A second thing I want to point to is they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So it was sent by the men who were trusted to carry sums of money. If there's anything that you need in ministry, it's trustworthy people when it comes to finances. Trustworthy. Because there have been many, many people in churches who have robbed God, stealing offerings, stealing money. I was reading recently of a church that had on a Sunday morning, their, uh, not the whole offering, but a good portion of their offering was stolen. $600,000. Let that number sink for just a moment. Somebody stole from this church. It's a very huge church, obviously. $600,000. There's just something about filthy lucre that draws people's hearts. That you'd even steal from God. That you'd even steal from God. And so when it comes to finances... You always want the most trustworthy people to be around the finances. You always do. And that giving us some insight into Barnabas and Saul. They were men of integrity. Somebody said the character and labors of these men had marked them out as the most fit to be bearers of this help. And it was from Jerusalem that Barnabas had been sent at first to Antioch. He was a trustworthy man. Saul was a trustworthy man. And in matters of finance, you need to always have trustworthy people because it's amazing how even a little money can turn a person's heart. So whenever you 
handle finances, you need to have trustworthy people. In our fellowship, I have very trustworthy people who handle the finances. I never handle them at all, just so that you know. I don't know who gives in this church. I don't, I don't, I don't ask that question. I don't know who gives. I, I, I don't count the money. I don't handle the money. I don't carry the money. I don't even really ever see the money. That isn't something I do. I have trusted people who do all of that for me. We have teams of people who take care of that. All the offerings, anything we have. I'll have two or three people who handle it. They keep each other in check. They're overseen to make sure that they don't take the money because there are a lot of people who steal. And we do the best that we can to keep that from happening here. Just letting you know, we're very careful with the finances. We learned that from scripture. They had Barnabas, they had Saul, they were trusted, they handled the money. We'll stop here and we'll pick up next time in chapter 12.